We're going to spend some time uh, this morning talking about online learning, aka distance learning, aka remote learning. Any other names? Anybody knows? Asynchronous. Part of it is asynchronous. We'll, we'll talk about that today, actually. Part of it's asynchronous, part of it's synchronous. Blended. Hmm? Blended. 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 We'll talk about blended, too. Um, we're going to start with a talk by Brad Rathgiver, who is the uh, director of the online school for girls. Uh, and then we're going to have a, well, we call it a panel, but it's actually going to be an open discussion um, led by him and myself. But we really want to have a discussion. It's not, not really a presentation. Um, online learning started in independent schools close to 20 years ago when uh, Milton Academy delivered a computer science course to nobles over an ISDN video conference. Anybody remember ISDN? <laughs> I remember that I used to, when the phone company used to come and service our ISDN circuits, I told them it stood for I still don't know. <laughs> because it wasn't too reliable, but it worked very well at, uh, at Nobles. Um, but somehow, even though independent schools had a head start with online learning, um, we didn't gain any momentum 20 years ago, and higher education in the public school world sort of ran right by us. And they now are well entrenched in various forms of online learning. And independent schools are starting to realize that they also need to get involved. And that's really going to be the focus of what we talked about this morning, <coughs> online learning in independent schools. And we have a very good person to talk to us about that because Brad um, is entrenched in online learning at, at OSG. Um, and he has had um, an interesting, what I would call, lightning career. Um, before he was um, at the online school for girls, Brad was at the Holt and Arms School. And as far as I can tell from LinkedIn, uh, in seven years he had five different positions. So he moved quickly in the organization. He started out as a um, history and art history teacher then became director of academic technology, interim <coughs> school director, director of technology, and at some point he also became chairman of the board of the online school for girls. And uh, following that, he was appointed director of the online school for girls in June of 2011. Uh, and I believe that I, Brad will tell you, but I believe online school for Girls has about 70 some odd members of the schools. And they're all girls schools. Not all, but we'll get all to that soon. Okay, so there's been a change. <laughs> um, and I think that if you want to get a, a really good perspective on Brad, there's a blog on the online school for girls website that Brad maintains. And if you read the latest post, um, he talks about a report that came out from the Fordham Institute called Education Reform in the Digital Era. And uh, you can read the excerpts that Brad has um, pulled from the first chapter of that report. But essentially what it says is that in the online world, teachers are going to become more important than they have ever been before which is, for, for people who have uh, written about online learning for the last few years, seems almost counterintuitive, because a lot of what has been written is we can reduce the number of teachers. This is really, online learning is really a cost model, which allows you to, to, to teach larger numbers of people with fewer numbers of resources. That's been the <coughs> conventional wisdom. And one of the things that uh, you would learn if you took a course from the online school for girls is that that notion is completely wrong. Uh, and I have taken two courses um, from the professional development part of online school for girls. Both of them were small classes, and in both classes um, we got 
considerable amount of attention from the teacher. So it is not the conventional wisdom at all, at least not in independent schools. So um, rather than um, telling you more about what the online school for girls is and how online learning is, is bearing in the independent school world, I'm going to turn the podium over to Brad Rathbore. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, as Joel said, I'm Brad Rathgiver. I'm the director of the Online School for Girls, and he gave you, gave you my bio, um, <laughs> which is kind of, I, I guess in some ways, a little bit typical within the independent school world, and that we, we all end up, as you all know, doing 8 million things all, all day long. Um, I went to Old Arms to, to teach history and somehow ended up in technology, somehow at some point ended up a lower school director, coached and advised the whole time, and, um, and then moved into technology. About three years ago, I became particularly interested in independent schools, uh, position within online learning. Um, I, we kind of looked out at what the marketplace was offering for independent schools and online learning, and we saw that there was nothing like us. There was nothing that looked like an independent school, and in the case of the position I was coming from, an independent girls' school. And so we started to go out there and try to do that. You'll hear a little bit about the story as, um, as the morning goes along. You should know some of the bias points that are going into my position within online learning. These are different, I think, from anybody else that, that does full-time online, well, that does, that does online learning full-time within, um, within the field right now. You should know that I'm an independent school graduate. Uh, I graduated from a really, really small neighborhood middle school, independent school in Connecticut called Moreland Hill School. Anybody know that school? It has 60 students, now grades three through nine. Um, talk about a small little neighborhood school. Um, and then I went to boarding school at Hotchkiss. And that's definitely, both of those experiences have covered, have colored my, um, my work within online school for girls and, and online learning. As Joel said, I'm a, I've been a classroom teacher and administrator before within independent schools. Um, I'm particularly worried about the long-term sustainability of independent schools. I think that that was probably my personal motivation for getting into online learning. Um, and as Joel talked about, a lot of people do enter online learning because they think of some of the cost-saving measures that are potentials in there. We'll talk about those a little bit, but you'll see how that's not the primary focus of what what we end up doing at the online school for girls. Um, you should also know that I'm an advocate for, for supplemental, not full-time online learning. A lot of what we read about in the press, I'm sure probably, how many of you have seen the articles the New York Times has written over the last year about full-time online learning? If you have, you've noticed that they're, um, that they're very negative. And I think that there's good reason for that to be negative, quite frankly. However, the press has been very much focused on, on full-time online learning rather than supplemental learning. You should know from the start that I'm an advocate for online learning to be a supplement to what our students do rather than it being a full-time experience. Um, and I also really strongly believe, and you'll see this throughout this morning, that face-to-face -face teachers can learn a lot and should be learning a lot from online learning these days. And I'll try to make that argument as the morning goes along. But first, I'm going to ask for your participation. Um, I'd like you to, actually, before I said that, I'm going to, normally I take kind of questions. I, I, this is the first year that I've um, not been teaching 13-year-old girls. Um, and so I'm normally used to 13-year-olds you know, interrupting me at every moment um, and, and asking questions. Because, we're going to live, because we are live streaming this, um, I'd like to wait to questions towards the end because I, my guess is some of these questions we may want to turn the camera off for, but that's, that's a whole other thing. Um, okay, so when you hear the phrase online learning, what's your word association? Distance. Distance, great. <coughs> LMS. LMS. Come on. Asynchronous. Asynchronous, thank you. Self-pacing. Khan Academy. Khan Academy, good. CBT. CBT. <coughs> Self-directed. Self-directed. iTunes U. iTunes U. Stanford <coughs> the AI course. Stanford's AI course, right. Their 200,000 person artificial intelligence course. Okay. Credit recovery. Credit recovery. Social media. Social media. Open University. Open University. <coughs> TED. 
Head up. Test security. Test security. Test security? As in the text, the, the security of taking an exam online? Okay. Tech support required. Tech support required, right? There's the nervous tech director. Right? <laughs> what else? Come on, those of you that haven't talked, come on. Blended classroom. Blended classroom. Need. Need. <coughs> Lots the air. Flexible time. Lots of reading and writing. Lots of reading and writing. The air. Fear. What about the yeah, what about the ease or challenging? Fear. What's that? Challenging. Challenging. Often people that have taken online courses will say challenging. Often people that haven't taken online courses will say easy. Time management. Time management. Flip classrooms. Flip classrooms. Yeah. Isolate. Isolate. Gamification. Gamification. Cool. Yeah. Impersonal, even though you can talk. Impersonal. Yeah, that's definitely a. Anything at cost? Expensive. Expensive? Inexpensive. Expensive to run. Inexpensive, to run. In inexpensive often, yeah. To take cheaper than indispensable, right? Okay, humor me on this one here for a second. Your word association with independent schools? Personal. Personal. Or class. Expensive. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? Exclusive. Exclusive. Small class size. Yes. Small class size. Elite. Declining Elite. Role. Culture. Declining enrollment. <laughs> What's that? Autonomy. Athletic. Athletic. Paycheck. Paycheck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> for the science. Yeah. Well rounded. Limited resources. Limited resources. Okay. Financial aid. Financial aid. Whole child. Whole child. Direct accountability to parents. Direct accountability. Tradition. Tradition. Old school. Old school. <laughs> Saturday class. Saturday class. <laughs> <laughs> Culture. Culture. So what we find here is that actually the words that we're using to describe online learning are often in direct contrast with the words that we use to describe independent schools. Impersonal versus personal. <coughs> flexible versus really inflexible in a lot of ways, at least with our schedules often. Saturday classes may be a good example of that. You know, cheaper versus more expensive. Um, educating the one subject area potentially versus educating the whole child. We've set ourselves within our minds to think that online learning can't be something that independent schools do. And yet, that's not necessarily the case. It just happens to be that most of what online learning is today is in conflict with independent schools. Probably 99.5% of what is out there today in the world for online learning is in conflict with what our vision of independent schools is. Part of what I'm going to try to help everybody see today is that it, is that, that doesn't have to be the case. And that unfortunately we've been governed by a lot of fear relating to online learning. And my major goal for you today is to help you see some of the opportunity out there. There is some reason, though, that we've had some fear. The fear, I think, has, been, um, has come from the place that we haven't tried to reach, or we haven't seen ways to reach, our mission and our school's philosophy through online learning before. But my general premise is that schools can find opportunity if they keep their philosophy and mission at the center of what they do within online learning. When they move that away from the center, they're losing themselves in the process. So that'll be my general premise today. We've had a lot of fear within the independent school community, sometimes for very good reason, um, and often because we don't understand the larger picture of what's going on within online learning but that there is opportunity available 
if schools keep their philosophy and mission at the center of what they do. So let's talk a little bit about this fear that's out there. These are all the different dimensions of an online program, or that could be part of an online program. This is from a group called uh, iNACOL, which is the K-12 Online Learning Association. Is anybody familiar with iNACOL? iNACOL is, is, if you're not familiar, there's, there's one group to become, start to become familiar with. Uh, so iNACOL kind of represents all of both the for-profit and non-profit non -profit associations um, that deal with online learning. They've tried to break down online learning into different dimensions. And you can see that any school might have a different type of comprehensiveness, supplemental versus full-time, a different type of reach, a different type, different locations that they may be going after, different delivery methods, operational control, etc. There are many different types of online learning. The type of online learning that the program that I have to run only fits into a couple of these boxes. So as I'm starting to think, you know, as we start to think about well, what do we do with the online school for girls world, supplemental program with a global reach that's private, that's location is different than just school or home, its mo delivery model is asynchronous, it's consortium based, it's building online, online, et cetera. But different online programs can have different dimensions depending on what their choices are at the beginning and setting them up. So one of the things to know from the beginning is there are many, many, many different types of online learning available and out there. And so to think of the field of online learning as all being the same is incorrect. Does that make sense? That's the first barrier I want you to break down, is that online learning has different dimensions and can mean de many different things depending on its purpose. You should know, though, that as the field of online learning, as this whole field, there were 1.8 million high school students, oops, 1.8 million high school students who took online courses in 2010-11. 1.8 million high school students. Most of this happened through statewide virtual learning schools. There are some districts that have set up, some, some school districts that have set up virtual learning schools, but most of those 1.8 million, 1.8 1.8 million came from, um, came from statewide virtual learning schools. This is a place where public schools are very much further ahead than independent schools. The largest state that's become involved in online learning is the state of Florida. In Florida, there are more than 1 million K-12 students who take online courses this year. 1 million students in the state of Florida take, took online courses this year, K-12. The state of North Carolina has seen some of the explosive growth that we see typically within online learning. Three years ago, they had 5,000 students taking online courses in their North Carolina virtual program. Uh, two years ago, they had 15,000 students. Last year, they had 75,000 students. They're expecting 150 to 200,000 students next year. In the what tends to happen is that once a state creates policy to allow for online learning and puts some resources towards online learning options for its students, it explodes within that state. This has not happened as much within the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic to a little bit lesser extent. However, we can see it coming. There are a number of states um, across New England that have started to put forward legislation to allow for greater online learning opportunities for their students. Connecticut just passed uh, some educational reform opportunities. Um, New Hampshire's done the same thing recently. We expect pretty rapid online learning growth within these communities. In states where we have seen tremendous online learning growth, it has started to impact independent schools as students have more and different choices than they've had before. The scary thing for an independent school, I think, though, is that this growth happens really rapidly within their community. When this growth hits, it hits hard. Are you taking questions? I'm sorry, I don't know. If you don't mind, I'm going to wait till the end, but, okay. but we'll, we can certainly delve back to all this stuff. You should also know that 90% of online learning is supplemental. Again, if you just read the newspapers and you know happen to see some articles on online learning, you would think that most of it is full time. However, you should know that 90% of online learning um, is supplemental. And that this is something that's seen explosive growth within colleges over the last number of years. Last year, there were 6.1 million college kids who took online courses as part of their four-year away-from-home college experience. 
31% of all college students took online courses last year. And we're starting to see this happen more and more at, again, four year away from home schools like most of our students are attending. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times last year, Learning the Dorm Because Classes on the Web, that talked about how at my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill, um, you can't take Spanish 1 in a face-to-face -face classroom anymore. If you want to take Spanish 1 at Chapel Hill, you have to take the online course. If you want to take, um, or students at the University of Florida, 90% of them choose to take Econ 101 online versus going into the face-to-face -face classroom and taking that class. University of Iowa, known for its creative writing program, 50% or more of its creative writing courses are now online courses versus face-to-face -face courses. So more and more and more, we see online course experiences as part of a, a student's typical four year away from home college experience. Which I'll tell you, when we started to see some of these statistics come out three years ago when the numbers were much smaller, we started to ask ourselves within Walton Arms School, how are we preparing our students for this reality? What is it that we're doing within our schools to make sure that our students are ready to take online courses, not just in four year undergrad, experience, but in professional schools and beyond. You should also know that there are a lot of for-profit players within the online field, and that they often masquerade as other things. K-12 Inc. is the largest of these companies. K-12 Inc. is a, is a for-profit company out of Vienna, Virginia. Um, it was helped founded by former Education Secretary uh, Bill Bennett, um, and uh, has started to become um, really the largest player within online, within online learning <coughs> for a number of reasons, including that they are often the back-end course provider for things that are called other things. So for example, a lot of statewide virtual schools will contract with K-12 to offer courses. Uh, K-12 uh, has done this with universities as well. Um, I think the most relevant to this audience would be that K-12 recently contracted with George Washington University to offer George Washington Online High School, a fully online high school um, branded by George Washington. These are courses that are K-12 courses uh, on the back end and taught uh, by graduate students in the Department of Education at GW because, in large part because, um, GW wanted to make sure that its graduate students in education had the experience of teaching an online course before graduating. So the courses, you know, or this whole program is branded, again, George Washington Online High School. The courses really, though, are K-12 courses at the back end. When we talk about teaching within these courses, there's much less, much less autonomy um, for teaching um, than we would think of within an independent school classroom, but even in a public school classroom. Um, K-12 also, so K-12 has, has allowed some universities to quickly compete with independent schools. GW is marketing, by the way, the George Washington Online school, High School in a lot of different settings. I've seen them advertise at different NAS events, et cetera, in order to try to get some of the independent school market. Uh, K-12 also has its own branded online independent school um, called K-12 International Academy, which will give you college counseling, advising clubs, some different other things that they think of as part of the typical uh, private school experience. And you have competition now coming in from universities as well who are developing some of their own programs. Stanford University uh, has created, many of you are probably familiar with Stanford University's online high school, formerly known really now as the FT program. Uh, Stanford University's online high school offers both supplemental courses for students and a full-time academic program. Students can go and take Stanford University online, uh, online high school courses during the school year and then can go to Palo Alto during the summertime to take courses face-to-face -face if they'd like to. When they graduate, they graduate with a high school degree from Stanford University. And if you look at their college matriculation list, which many of you, because you see iPads on their computers in the room, will probably go do this right now. If you look at their college matriculation list, um, you will see that they compare well against any of the top independent schools. They are a member of NIS, they are a member of CAIS, California Association of Independent Schools, um, and they are definitely competing directly 
um, with independent schools for students. Every year I hear stories of a number of more schools saying that they've lost students to Stanford Online High School. Um, they also offer a flexibility in their program that we just can't offer within our independent schools or don't offer, choose not to offer within our independent schools. Think of the student who is the fabulous violinist, great soccer player, and smart student in the classroom. She now, instead of having to be at her desk in her school from 8 until 3.30 and then play on her um, school sports team from 3.30 until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm sorry, I'm moving around here and I'm making camera. Uh, from eight, <laughs> so instead, of being, instead of being tied down within her school setting from 8 until 5 every day, she now has the option of practicing violin with her expert teacher um, from 9 until 11 o'clock in the morning, playing with her club soccer team from 2 until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and doing her work between 11 and 2, and then after the soccer practice is done. This is a different type of flexibility, and quite frankly, some of the flexibility that some of our families are demanding of us. How many of you at day schools have, have had more and more families ask for early outs from your schedule in order for students to go and do different things? I mean, I know this was becoming a big issue within the Washington community um, over the last couple of years. Families were demanding more flexibilities, and schools were not ready for that type of flexibility. This type of option gives families another option. And it's something, because of the name brand recognition, um, that our families are particularly attracted to. We have heard that a number of other top flight universities are going to be replicating Stanford's model in the process of doing so, and we'll be announcing that within the next number of months. And then, of course, there's the options that have just come out um, through programs like Coursera and edX. Everybody familiar with these programs? Coursera is online courses um, offered through the consortium that includes Princeton and Michigan and, um, and uh, Stanford and Penn. Um, these are courses that they're expecting to enroll thousands upon thousands of students in, um, mainly lecture-based courses that have some type of assignments associated with them as well. edX is the program out of MIT and Harvard that's basically going to be a Coursera competitor. Um, all of these options coming from the universities, though, I think are starting to make us, um, I think that the, the major impact for those of us within independent school community, is that we're going to have to define what our, court, what our classrooms and courses look like as different than what the universities can provide. Um, and this, I think, is going to be a major challenge for us, especially because when we're talking about, especially when we look at costs associated here. <coughs> so Coursera and edX, they're free right now, or low cost, very low cost. K-12 International Academy is $7,000 a year. Stanford Online High School is approximately $14,000 a year. The average NIS tuition is $24,000. And, and I know because of the markets that we're talking about in here, we're talking about much higher often than $24,000 a year for tuition. There's a lot of reason for fear, right? Looking at these numbers? Let's, I'm going to stop there for a second, take a few questions, and, and even just some comments. How are, we, how are we feeling now, knowing a little bit more about, about this online learning landscape? What are some of the thoughts coming out now? Yeah. Okay, I'll speak now. Go for it. Uh, the, the million students in Florida, for example, how, do you have any data on how many of those kids are taking online courses towards the pursuit of a GED versus my school doesn't offer forensics, so I'm going to take it in Stanford? I, I don't have specific statistics for you, but I'll tell you that a lot of times online courses are grown both at the top end of the curriculum and then at the bottom end of the curriculum. So often, You'll start to see you'll, you'll see students start to gravitate towards online courses either for um, the top AP classes that their school doesn't offer or for uh, graduate or credit recovery. Uh, in fact, in Florida, this all came out of its old um, correspondence course model, which was exactly that too. Brad, would you mind repeating questions for the screen? Absolutely. Uh, when you're talking about um, GW's. Uh, Branding up K-12 offering. I'm just curious: is are the staff K-12 staff, or is it GW professors? Good question. Instruct people hired by GW instruct instructors. Good question. It, it, the question was: um, when you're talking about uh, white labeling of, of courses from K-12 or any other course provider, does the staff come from uh, 
does the staff come from the school or does the staff come from K-12? In GW's case, it's graduate students who, have, who are in the Department of Education, or School of Education at GW. Um, but in other schools, they have that choice. You as a school could go to, and this is potentially scary to some folks in here, as a school, you could go to K-12 tomorrow and say, I want to start X Academy online. They can get you the branding, get you all set up and ready to go with a full array of courses tomorrow. And you can choose to have their teachers teach courses, teachers that they have contracted to teach courses, teach the classes, or, um, or teachers who are um, for your own. So you actually have a choice within that matter. Good question. Yeah. Didn't know if you were aware of this. We are the, I'm at the Harvard School in San Jose. Yep. We were approached with someone who wanted to franchise us. Yep. Uh, and also wanted to hire, wanted us to provide college counseling to an independent school in the box that they were trying to launch. Yep. That that happens. That's happening more and more. Um, I've definitely currently growing out of LA, and and they're there. He he's got some action. There are some folks, there's, I know of somebody in LA that's, that's trying to do this. This is happening all, definitely all across the country right now, um, where we've seen a number of independent schools either approach or independent schools approaching um, some of the for-profit providers to get themselves online quickly. Uh, personally, I think that there's real danger in that, <laughs> um, but we can talk about that as the, as the morning goes along too. Uh, yeah, Tom. Why do you think the penetration in the mid-Atlantic uh, states is less than other areas in the public school sector? The question is why do I think that the penetration within the mid-Atlantic states and really New England states is yeah. less than in some other areas? It's all because of policy created at the statewide level. Um, so within Florida, Florida was the first to really kind of look at this as an opportunity. Created this during a budget crisis in the state of Florida in the late 90s under Governor Bush down there. Um, and has grown, has grown the program, created the policies to allow the program to grow dramatically. Same thing happened within North Carolina, and the same thing has started to happen within a number of other states recently. There are also there have also been a number of other states that have um, started to create graduate requirements, graduation requirements, high school graduation requirements for their students to take an online course as part of their high school experience. This is something we're definitely seeing more and more of. Um, there are now five states that, that require students to take an online course as part of their high school experience for high school graduation. Um, so as policies are created within the states, that's when we tend to see them grow dramatically. Do, do you see movement? Uh, yes. In uh, you know, New Jersey, New England? Yeah. Again, we've seen, we've, we've seen it a little more in Connecticut and, and New Hampshire this year. Um, but we expect to see a lot more over the next couple of years. It's, it's tended to be, honestly, it's tended to be in states that are dominated by Republican legislatures and governors that have been more open to the opportunities <coughs> earlier. We were like, regarding Tom, I don't know if you know about this, but in New Jersey, up near where I'm in Burton County, uh, it's been in the paper, it's in like in the last week, and, and at one city, TNEC, they went to a virtual charter school. Mm -hmm. And that's become something that it's gotten, I think, to the point where the state legislature actually is maybe doing legislation related to that. So there's something going on there. It, again, this, this tends to happen really quickly, and then when it happens, it hits communities really hard. Um, if any of you have colleagues in the state of Tennessee, Tennessee has seen this happen um, in the last year in a big way. Um, and it's definitely changed the landscape in Tennessee. Yeah? Any of you, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, many of the uh, GW University or high school taught by grad students. Any of the other proportion of, of who is teaching these online courses? Are they mostly credit school teachers who do this for supplemental income, or are they university professors teaching? It de totally depends on the course and on the provider. Totally depends on the course provider. I know that Stanford employs a lot of graduate students to teach their online courses, uh, but it totally depends on the course provider. It's, there's huge, huge array of, of, of this. I would also say that a lot of the largest of these schools um, are really relying upon computer analytics to guide students through coursework rather than it being taught 
in the way that we're all envisioning a class being taught. So we're kind of talking here about modules that are created so that students think of, you know, I know Khan Academy's got a huge press and for a lot of good reason, um, especially since it's an open platform right now. But there are lots of more sophisticated, quite frankly, <laughs> platforms out there that are in the for-profit world to help guide students through curriculum module by module by module. So the interaction between a student and a teacher within a large course offered by a for-profit course provider or most universities is very little between the student and the teacher. The teacher may have 100, 200, 300 students, or in the case of these enormous courses, 200,000 students in their classes. So the teaching that goes on there might be to answer a question, might be to once in a while post a discussion board. It's not the type of interactive hand-holding personal learning um, that we might think of in our classroom. I'm not saying that, I, I'm trying not, as you can tell, I hope you can tell, I'm trying not to disparage what's going on because I think that there's actually some, some good for the overall educational community going on here. Um, I just do think that it's important to understand that there's a big difference, again, between what happens with what we think of as an independent school education um, and what's going on within the vast, vast, vast majority of online learning, including, and importantly including for this community, what's uh, the difference between uh, what's going on at the colleges with the colleges and online learning. Yeah? You spoke about fear and um, online classes not replacing the teachers. For classroom teachers today in terms of professional development, how do we stay on top of this and, and get involved in the online? Great, great question. I'm, I'm going to use that as a transition point to move into the next area then. Great. So the question was, um, how do we stay, help our faculty stay on top of what's going on with an online learning um, in order to take advantage of the opportunities there? Right, because they feel okay. like Right, this is, I don't know what this is, this is, I'm totally afraid of this. Right, and, okay, have I ratcheted up the tier this morning so far? <laughs> have I? A little bit? Okay. Um, I, I hope that, I, I was trying to ratchet up the tier just a little bit here for a second, because now I think it's time for us to go ahead and explore some of the opportunity that's out there. So I'm going to do this by talking about opportunities out there for students, opportunities out there for faculty members by engaging with online learning, and opportunities out there for schools. And I'm going to do this mainly through story. So I'm going to tell you a number of stories about student opportunity, about faculty opportunity, and about opportunities for schools. Opportunities that are available perhaps in other ways than online learning, in some cases, but are enhanced, I think, and um, some unique to online learning. Make sense? Okay. Um, first, I think it's important to you know just a little bit about the online school for girls um, so that it makes sense here what types of opportunities I'm talking about, especially for our students. So the online school for girls was created three years ago to try to bring an independent girls' school approach to online learning. So again, we looked out at the online learning marketplace three years ago. And we saw, well, this is what some of the universities are doing. This is what some of the for-profits are doing. This is what some schools and school districts are doing and states are doing. Nothing really looks like us. Can we create something in this marketplace, something within online learning that looks like us? So we decided to create an independent girls' school approach to online learning. In doing so, we wanted to create a way for every school that educated girls to become a part of OSG. Um, there are, I know there are a couple of girls' schools in the room, but there aren't that many. Where, where are girls' schools? We're actually in Brazil. I know. Very in, in Oak Knoll, right? Yeah. Great, okay. So you can ask your girls' school's colleagues about this, but, but part of the girls' school ethos and, and part of the Kool-Aid that I've certainly drank over the last few years, having worked in girls' schools for a while, has been uh, we're very much not top-down organizations. We're very much collaborative communities um, that try to be as inclusive as possible. And so as we were creating the online school for girls, we wanted to create a way that all schools could become a part uh, of this network and learn from the network uh, in the ways that made sense to them. We also wanted to uh, use research relating to the ways that girls learn best with computers and technologies as our guiding philosophy. So what we did is we went out and commissioned a study from the Center for Research on Girls at the Laurel School 
to help us understand um, what the research said in this regard. And what the research said was that everything in your class needs to be geared towards connection, collaboration, creativity, and application. Girls need to feel connected with each other in order to be learning at their best, especially with computers and technology, although we know that this is true within our face-to-face -face girls' schools as well. The girls need to be working collaboratively with each other. They need to be thinking um, in terms of, of, of teamwork. Um, you need to inspire creativity, and you need to reward creativity in your classrooms. So we just try to do that. And everything that you, need, that you do within your classrooms needs to be tied to real-world application. So we've made connection, collaboration, creativity, and application the hallmark of our program and our guiding philosophy for our program to the point where every teacher evaluation is based on this. Every student evaluation of teachers is based on this. The students are polled regularly to see how much they see collaboration, creativity, application, and connection within their classes. We are constantly looking at this. That's become our guiding philosophy. When I say that we've had a number of, we, we wanted to create this open network, um, we also knew that we were going to see some, some growth. Um, in our first year of our program, we saw uh, 50 students enroll in the classes. It was a pilot year. Um, to give you a sense of this, this might show you a little bit how different we are than most independent schools. We thought of the idea in February of 2009. Uh, we got four schools together in April 2009. <coughs> We uh, created bylaws and, uh, and the program structure in June of 2009, and we launched our first pilot courses in September of 2009. So we went from idea in February to courses in September, which I know is very different from <laughs> the way most independent schools operate. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did that with 50 pilot students in our first year. Uh, the next year we had 135 student enrollments. The year after that, this year, this school year that we've just ended, uh, we had 309 enrollments. Um, and at this point, for the 2012-13 school year, we have 437 enrollments. So we've seen some of the explosive, and by the way, we're expecting, at this point last year, we only had 170 enrollments. We're expecting to see about six to 700 enrollments for next school year. So we've seen some of the explosive growth that we see within online education as a whole. And as we've done that, we've grown the network of schools. Initially, we started with four schools. Uh, we had a number of schools that joined us as, as, as member institutions really providing seed money for the school. Um, and then we've had a number of schools join us as affiliates. Not all of the schools that have joined us as affiliates are, um, are even independent schools. There's one public school district that's joined us as an affiliate. Um, and we have a number of now co-ed schools that have joined us as affiliates as well, either to, offer, either to help them offer courses for their girls or just to take better advantage of the professional development community that we've built. At this point, we have 67 schools that are part of this network. So we've grown from four to 67. So in doing so, we think we've built opportunities again for students, for faculty, and for our schools. We share with you a few of the opportunities we've built for our students. We think that our courses have facilitated a greater understanding than we could possibly have within some face-to-face -face courses. For example, this is an AP government class that met via a Skype group chat um, on the evening of the President's State of the Union address. So at the State of the Union, after the State of the Union address, their teacher, Mike Walton, who teaches, used to teach down in uh, Los Angeles at Marlboro School, now teaches up at Oregon Episcopal School in Portland, Oregon. Mike, in Portland, convened his class for a group Skype chat. And how the students come in there, um, his students in this class happen to be from really all over the US. And he asked them a very simple question. He said, what was the major theme of President Obama's address? The answer fascinated at least the educators that were gathered in this room as well. Because the students from Dallas said energy issues. The students from Cleveland, Ohio said jobs. The students from Hawaii said import-export issues. And students from other places were saying other things. It was helpful to the class to understand that just depending on where you listen to the speech from and the types of issues that are pro most prominent within your community would depend, uh, would, would matter greatly in how you heard the president. Same speech, different themes picked up by different kids. That's the type of lesson that you know, we might be able to tell our kids if this is the case within within our face-to-face -face schools. Or in, with boarding schools, we can tell you know, kids from different areas can share that. 
But to have these kids sitting in their homes, their bedrooms sometimes, you know, just sharing this with, with, their, with their classmates um, became a really powerful learning experience and one that would be very difficult uh, to replicate within a face-to-face -face classroom. We also use a lot of project-based approaches. We try to, again, take advantage of kids in different places with project-based and service-based approaches. Our um, environmental science class, for example, has a service learning project associated with it. Service learning is not something that is um, typically associated with online learning. I don't know of many other online courses that offer service learning projects. However, when you're studying water issues within environmental science, again, it becomes more powerful when kids are doing service projects from New York City, from Dallas, Texas, from Los Angeles, California, from DC and talking about the Chesapeake, and from Hawaii. And in this case, we also had kids from Sydney, Australia. <coughs> so you had all of these different perspectives coming into the classroom. Different students perhaps working on the same project, but having different results because of the community that they were working in. Again, it becomes a more powerful learning experience than we can offer within our face-to-face -face classes. We also can create global connections in a way that I don't think we can, again, within face-to-face -face classrooms. Again, I know 40 schools perhaps might argue with me a little bit on this. Um, earlier this year, I was in uh, New York, uh, in Westchester County, at School of the Holy Child in, in Rye, New York. And I met a student here, Helen, who was telling me, that, uh, telling me about her Japanese class. In Japanese one, um, our, our teacher pairs up students with a student from another school in order to practice their Japanese in real time. Um, at least once a week. So Helen had been paired up with a student down here at Hockaday, uh, Hockaday School in Texas. The student was a boarding student though at Hockaday and was a native Mandarin speaker. Helen had taken Mandarin through the levels that her school had offered already by her junior year and so was taking Japanese during her senior year but wanted to continue to practice her Mandarin. The student down at Hockaday wanted to continue to practice her English. So as they got on Skype, they practiced not only the Japanese that they were required to practice for the class, but they practiced English and Mandarin. Cool global connection that wouldn't have existed without the program. We think that we're also building actual real-time, real, uh, real lifelong 21st century skills. And I know I, got, I have some problems with the term 21st century skills, as I'm sure some of you also do in this room. Um, but I'll give you an example of, of this. Uh, students in AP government class again are asked to create their own electoral system as part of the class. Again, product-based approaches, trying to roll application stuff. In this class, they're asked to create an, their own electoral system and a new electoral system for the country. Um, and purposely in this class, you can imagine the teacher is asking students from different regions to participate in this, in this work. Uh, so he will have students, again, all over the country, four students in, in this group project, and then they have to come up and on a wiki site create their electoral college system. In the process of this though, they also have to describe how they went about as a team working together. They had to do team reflection on the process. So they talk about the entire, um, the entire process of them getting together. You can see that they've taken a screenshot of a group Skype window um, because that's how they collaborated um, in real time. They worked within the wiki on real time. Um, and they had to learn how to work together across, in this case, seven different time zones with this group. Because in this case, we had <laughs> or four, different, four different time zones with seven stretching, I guess. Actually, more than that. Because we had a student in this class from Hawaii, and this particular group was from Hawaii. We had a student who was at a boarding school in Connecticut but was studying abroad with SYA in Spain. So she was taking this class because the AP government wasn't offered with their SYA program in Spain. So we had Spain, Hawaii, uh, New York City, and I think Dallas was another one on this one. Uh, all working together on this project, they had to figure out when they were going to meet and how to work together. The teacher, of course, gave them some guidance on different methods that they could use to work together, but they actually had to do it. They actually had to work together with each other's schedules, figure out how they were going to work together, and put together a final project. When they all were very rarely able to get together for a group stuff like that. How many times was this between Spain and Hawaii? By the way, it's not seven, it's about 10, isn't it? 10 or 11, something like that. They had to figure out, you know, this across 10 different times. <coughs> we also think that online learning can create a different type and a greater reflection, greater um, experience with reflection, and develop students' voices um, perhaps more effectively. 
Um, I know that this is something that, that, that some independent schools will take some issue with because we talk within our independent schools about being able to develop each student's voice very well within, within our classrooms um, and valuing each voice, each participant's voice within the classrooms. However, in an online class, every student has to participate and has to have pretty close to equal participation. This is very different, of course, than our face-to-face -face classes. Even within our great independent school classes, even with the best teachers, we have students who are reticent, who are wildflowers. That's just not allowed within an online class. You have to be an active participant within an online class. What we actually find is that the kids who are more reticent and are wildflowers within face-to-face -face learning, they really blossom in the online setting. In large part because we think that they now have time for reflection that they don't within a face-to-face -face class. It's not that they didn't have anything to say, and it's not that they didn't want to say anything, but they didn't have time to formulate that opinion and develop that voice. And so through online learning, we think that we can develop voices of our students perhaps more powerfully, again, through reflection. And of course, then we've expanded opportunities. So now all these schools within our network are able to offer additional courses um, that, that they hadn't been able to offer before. And that's, we you know, uh, a powerful thing for, for the schools. You'll note, though, that this is probably the first thing you thought of in terms of opportunities for students. Courses, right? Everybody thinks typically when you think of online learning, OK, we can expand our courses. I actually think, from an educator's perspective, this may be not the most important thing. I actually think that those other five things that I was mentioning before were just as important, in some cases more important, than just offering additional courses to students. <laughs> I'll stop there for a second. Questions about student opportunities and experiences. <clears throat> yeah. Are you going to throw anything in about the use of clicks and order for those of us who are doing some of the online stuff with kids that we also see face to face? Clicks and mortar. Uh, you mean a co combination of blended, blended, blended learning? Blended. Right. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, and we can talk about that certainly in, in other sessions too. Um, again, the program that, that we're offering is, is all supplemental. So we're talking about students who are three classes, three, you know, three face-to-face -face classes and two online classes. Um, different people have different definitions of blended learning. Some people think of blended learning as a blend of those types of experiences. Um, other people think of the blend as within the class itself. We can talk about the blend within the class itself at, at, within another session. Uh, I think that's a great, great topic for you. Yeah. One, we've been looking at uh, the last year all sorts of ways of uh, learning, but one that our concerns and maybe talk about later is that the relationship with the teacher. We, we look at the higher it makes a lot more sense because that's much less important. It's much more about the content. But how many of us and our students are passionate about a course, not because they have any interest in it, but all of a sudden the teacher's passion and then right. they're hanging out after class to talk about it a little right. bit more. Mm -hmm. So how you how, how that dynamic works, I'd like to hear about as now or as we go. Sure. So the, Tom asked a good question here, and that is how do, you, how do you translate some of the passion of the instructor? How do you translate some of the passion of the teacher into an online classroom? My answer to that is you can if you're talking about a 30 or 40 or 50 person class or more. It's very, or it's very, very difficult to. Um, my argument is that in classes that are small and kept small online, you can't you can still develop that personal relationship. You can see, I mean, within these classes, these students are developing relationships with each other, and they're developing relationships with their teacher. So the teacher uh, can have an understanding of where each student is within the course, um, and can help meet them where they are within the within their learning of that course. I don't necessarily know if that's the case with a class that's 50 or 60 or 70. And personally, I don't think that that's the case. Classes, but you're six or seven. I do think, and this is this is another point that I didn't I didn't kind of highlight here. With online learning, though, you can have greater differentiation within your classroom than you can often within a face-to-face -face class. Blended classes, you can argue, would have would still have some of those advantages of differentiation. But within an online class, you can have greater differentiation because you do have all of these resources available to you, uh, and as long as you know your students, you can help guide them along the right path. Yeah. Are there some key questions that we should be asking ourselves about creating an online system? Yes. Let's get to that towards the end, if that's okay. Sure. Great. 
Are there uh, are there students that, that are kind of selected out from online learning because for whatever reason it's just not going to fit for them? That's a good question. The question is, are there students who are selected out by their schools typically, I guess is the question. Um, well, you can find them or their parents or they're self-selected out yeah. um, from taking online classes because of whatever. It, for us, that's not something that we'll dictate as the online school for girls, but some of our member schools will say you need to do X, Y, and Z in order to be able to do this. Um, we tend to give some guidelines to schools, but it can vary greatly by school. Um, and we know that schools develop their own culture internally too, that either uh, that, that that can create different types of uh, situations that would be helpful for a student. I'll, I'll give you an example. There there are some schools that are extraordinarily flexible with their students and don't care where they are when they're not in the classroom. Okay, they wander around the campus. They can go to do X, Y, Z. They have all these options. Da da da. da. It's fine. But there are schools that are very very regimented with their students. If you're not in class, you are here. If you're not here, you are here, et cetera. For a class that's very flexible, for a school that's, that's set up in this very flexible way and that's set that as part of their culture, we're going to say to them with the online classes, we'll be as flexible with your online classes and the students taking online classes as, as you are with the rest of your students. You know, let them do this at any time that makes sense to them. You've developed this ethos within your school. They need to work within that ethos. For a school that has a very regimented schedule, we're going to say to them, listen, set up a room in your library. Set up a classroom where your kids who are taking online classes can go or should go when, they're, when they have that block um, for online classes. Set up a block in their schedule for an online class. Have that same regimentation that you've developed through the rest of your program, through your culture and your ethos of your school, within the online program you create. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I was more wondering about, you were talking about earlier, the kid that's resident to say something in class kind of blossoms in the, uh, in the online, I was wondering if the reverse is true, are, are there uh, types of students that yeah. aren't going to work well? Well, and, and, and yes, and they're, well, I don't think that it's necessarily not work well. Um, I actually am a, a proponent of, of all students in high school having uh, having an online course experience while they're in high school because I think that that's just part of what they're gonna, the way that they're going to be learning going forward. Um, however, there are students that have greater frustrations with them online courses because it doesn't fit the ways that they're used to learning. Absolutely. Um, you know, the kid that's used to being able to dominate a classroom discussion can get really frustrated with an online classroom in their first couple weeks because they can't dominate it in the same way. But that's not necessarily a bad thing for that kid. Yeah. Um, earlier, you you listed several missions of 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 your approach, including creativity. Yeah. Um, and actually, let me back up and say that I'm I'm very pro blended learning, <laughs> um, but it's still kind of a critical question. So I'd love to hear how you define creativity, which then also flows into my another part of the question, which is um, so you give the example of the Skype chat after Obama's address. Yeah. Um, and you showed the different students showing the, how the online discussion, the, the online discussion showed how different students to, had took away different things from the, from the, um, from the yeah. Um, so my question is, how do you, or the next part of my question is, how do you measure whether that effect that they, that was illustrated really well, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you measure whether that is learned? I mean, does it, does it change the student's behavior um, like 10 years from now? Are they going to, do you, do you have a way of measuring whether they're going to make different decisions or, or, or read into a speech differently because of no. that? No, and we, you know, we're three years old too, so the longitudinal studies, you know, we haven't done any of that yet. So it's still uh, it's the anecdotal evidence, uh, not, not even evidence. Anecdotally, it sounds like an interesting story. Right. And I mean, creativity, we can all say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds like a good thing, but what is I wouldn't what think of this, I, I mean, obviously, we, we've kind of put our, our foot into being part of the PBL camp, the project-based learning camp, not fully, you know, we're not, we're not jumping in there, but we've, we've definitely put a few toes and, and perhaps a foot into the camp of, of buying into project-based learning, okay? Um, so I think it's more a question about project-based learning, actually, than it is a question about uh, online education. Uh, creativity, I think, can be managed or can be uh, 
can be measured in different ways and it will mean different things for different classes too. I mean, our, our digital art and design class, there's no question with some of the places that we can, you know, inspire creativity. I would argue, though, that, you know, having the kids design their own electoral system within pretty soft parameters is a pretty creative project for an AP government class. Um, and it's inspiring students to do something different than what they would do um, just learning about the electoral colleges. So we're talking mainly, when we're talking about creativity, we talk a lot about kind of inspiring kids um, and valuing the voice that they bring to the table. Um, and then again, that can mean different things for different classes. Math classes, honestly, it's much more difficult to do that. Uh, but if you've seen my blog, you'd see like, for example, a picture of that a kid turned in, she was, she was having a hard time visualizing a concept um, that they were studying multivariable calculus. And so the teacher said to her, well, just, just you know, try to show me what you mean. So she carved an apple into the shape of what she was trying to visualize within the mathematical format. What a cool idea. What a cool idea. At least you can see the picture up on the line. <coughs> um, let me go into, I'm trying to stay practice of time here. So we have until 10, 10? I should yeah, I can probably tell you. Great. I want to make sure that we leave a lot of time <coughs> at the end too. Talk about some opportunities for faculty and staff that we've been able to develop through the program. Uh, one of the things that you should know is we do offer a whole bunch of professional development courses um, where we try to connect faculty and administrators from around the country around different ideas. Uh, this is Murray Gantz. Murray Gantz teaches AP Biology at the Hockaday School in Dallas, Texas. Murray would tell you two years ago that he was totally against using technology in his classroom and that his AP class did just fine, thank you very much. And if you looked at his AP scores, you would see that 90% of the students or more every year scored five on their AP bio tests. And so, you know, tough to argue with, with a guy like Murray. Murray, uh, open, slightly open-minded guy that he was at that point, um, decided to take a professional development course in blended learning that we offer. Um, and really, really, um, came onto the idea of flipped classrooms about two years ago. So this is, he was one of the kind of early adopters, I would say, of flipped classrooms within independent schools. Uh, Murray decided that he was going to dedicate the whole rest of the summer to creating, um, to creating some of those lecture videos for his AP Biology class, and that he was just going to go ahead and flip his classroom. Again, kind of an interesting guy that he goes from really being hesitant about this to all of a sudden I'm going to go all in. And especially because he's talking, we're talking about an AP teacher at a highly respected school who has had extraordinary results with his classes. So Murray goes ahead and flips his classroom and realizes, first off, that the 45-minute lecture that he might have delivered before to his AP biology class is now all of a sudden a seven-minute lecture. How many of you that have had teachers flip their classroom have experienced the same type of thing? As soon as you go from the face-to-face -face lecture to your students to an online lecture, you realize that <laughs> there was a lot of fluff within that 45 minute lecture. And that there's actually more effective ways of delivering things in shorter amounts of time. So Murray goes from the 45 minute lecture to the seven minute lecture, flips his, flips his AP biology class, and the point that made him understand how powerful this was was when he started to count up his labs in the end of this class. And he realized that he did more labs between the start of school and Columbus Day that year than he had the entire previous year in the first year that he closed the classroom. Entire year, he had done more labs uh, between Star School and Columbus Day than he had the entire year previous. That made him realize the approach of flipping the classroom could be really helpful, and he wanted to share that with the world. So if you want to go and find blended learning biology, you'll see the blog of Murray Gantz. Um, and you'll see his journey as a teacher, um, going again from being reticent and hesitant about technology in the classroom being a full-time kind of believer in this and, and trying to go out there and spread his word. Um, we never, I, if you ask the folks at Hockaday, I don't think they would have told you that Murray would have made that journey and kind of a cool journey for him to make. We're also trying to expand the personal learning networks of, of our faculty and administrators within our schools. This is, um, this is from a class that we run with NIS that's on building strategic directions for your school. Um, and you can see these are the folks that are posted to a discussion board within the class. And what I've done is I've, I've drawn the lines across the map to show you where they're coming from. Now, many of them happen to come from the Mid-Atlantic region in this particular screenshot. 
Um, but around the country, students and fac or faculty members and administrators are connecting in ways that we haven't seen them connect before. And they're learning from each other and expanding their personal learning networks at the same time. They're also given a chance to have the experience themselves. And this, I can't underestimate the power of this. But the idea of an administrator or a faculty member going in and taking an online class and experiencing this new type of learning is the most awakening thing that an administrator can have. Um, it, it, it is extraordinarily powerful, as you know, to, uh, to learn by doing. And so by giving teachers a chance and administrators a chance to explore um, voice thread, for example, or a discussion board, or, um, or just the online learning environment, trying to get online for the first time to take a class. Um, experiencing what it can be like is extraordinarily powerful for our faculty members and administrators. Uh, and can be a great experience. So we've, we've decided to offer a whole bunch of professional development courses for, for faculty. Um, we do a course in blended learning to help faculty members understand how they can bring online learning techniques into the face-to-face -face classroom. We'll be talking again more about blended learning as we go on today. We do a course directly on the flipped classroom for a faculty member that wants to um, that wants to work on flipping their classrooms. We do a course called Single Gender Education, which is a course to onboard new faculty members at girls' schools to, uh, to working at a girls' school. Um, something we realized in, in our girls' schools, many girls' schools realized, was that we weren't doing a particularly good job of helping our teachers understand the difference of teaching in a co-ed environment versus a single-sex environment. Uh, and you know, often we were too worried about telling them about school policies and where the trash cans were and the coffee machines and all that the first couple of days of school and not doing much talking about how their pedagogies needed to change. We now do a four-week onboarding course for new faculty at girls' schools. We do a course called Teaching an Online Course, which is just that. Um, we do a course on brain-based learning on iPads in the classroom, and then we do a course with NIS as well that helps schools develop strategic directions for, for online learning approaches. So then there are some opportunities for schools. Actually, I'll stop there for opportunities for faculty members. Just a second. Yeah. This is really, really going to be obvious. But from the beginning, obviously coming from a girls' school and, and closing this as an online school for girls, what is the current argument that says we should still continue to only have this, your particular program, only for girls? What's our argument for, the question is, what's our argument for offering our program only for girls? Right. In other, okay. words, in other words, you broke out from a girls' school physically yes. into the online. What have, have there been discussions to program about expanding it to co-ed versus staying to all girls? And, and what's, what's been the discussion along those lines, if there's been any at all? Sure. Absolutely been a discussion, especially when there were, was nobody else within independent schools uh, going online. Uh, however, that wouldn't be true to our mission. And we've tried to keep our mission to the philosophy at the center of whatever we've done. Um, we've built our program towards, again, the research related to the ways that girls learn best with computers and technologies, of which there's a pretty substantial amount. Um, AAUW, American Association of American College, University of Association of University of Women, thank you, um, has done a number of studies on that over the last number of years. Um, and we've built a lot of our, we've built our program around um, around the ways that girls learn best with computers and technology. Some of that works pretty well for boys. Some of it is probably a different system. If I was personally building a system for, if I was building an online school for boys, I would have a lot more gaming theory built into it, and I would have a lot more, um, a lot more synchronous connection built into the classes. Wouldn't that, uh, just as a quick follow-up though, but I mean, what I'm hearing you just say right there, sounds very stereotypical. There are a lot of guys who learn just in the in the same way. I understand that to appeal and to I would probably have been one of them. Well, and I, I think I would as well. So <laughs> I know that there are certainly a lot of boys who may need to be entertained in order to learn. I, and that's not that's not what I'm that's no it's very different form. No, I just I'm saying I guess I'm wondering is is that you know, um, well, I, I, it's a, I, can, I can ask you later. It's, it's probably funny. it's probably a question actually more about single gender education than it is. online. It is, but, but but my point was that single gender education in a classroom when you've got physical dynamics is different than online. Well, that's it's, it's, you know, but that's that's, that's okay. okay. There's there I'll challenge you because there you're assuming that there is not much interaction. 
And in a classroom, again, with 40, 50, 60, 70 students, there wouldn't be much interaction. In a classroom that is more modular and that is analytics-based, where students working by themselves through the program, it wouldn't matter. But in a classroom that's 20 students, where you're all asking them to work together regularly, and where they're interacting with their teacher regularly, the argument coming from the single gender school perspective is that gender does matter. So that's, that's I think, that's, that's, that's the point that I would definitely take issue with. And there is now an alternative, too. And there is now an alternative. Well, there are, yeah, and there are a couple yeah. others on there. There are a couple others that are coming out there, too. Um, so there are some opportunities for schools, too. Uh, I want to just give you a couple examples of this. I think that there's now a chance for schools that are smaller schools to compete with some of the larger schools out there. Um, this is Lafayette Hawaii School for Girls, a wonderful school that's, if you ever want a place to retire to, I'm telling you all. <laughs> this Lafayette is on the foot of Diamond Head Mountain and uh, right off Waikiki Beach. And the classrooms either look down into Waikiki or up onto Diamond Head. It's the most spectacular setting for school you've ever seen. So Lafayette Hawaii School for Girls, a lovely school, um, is in the Hawaii Independent School Market. Anybody familiar with the Hawaii Independent School Market? It's dominated by a couple of behemoths of independent schools. Um, schools like Man Man School with 4,500 plus on three different islands. This is their campus, which you can see stretches just basically from the top of the mountain down to the bottom of the mountain. Uh, Punahou School with 3,000 students. Iolani School with 2,000 students. There are a number of enormous, enormous independent schools on, um, on Hawaii and particularly on Oahu. Um, La Pietra only has 200 students. Very small school. So was having trouble and was losing students to some of these larger schools because they just didn't offer some of the opportunities that an Iolani or a uh, Kamehameha or a Punapo could offer, especially within the classroom. However, by engaging with the online school for girls, one of the things that they were able to do was expand their course offerings to their students and connect their students in a way that none of, neither of those two schools could at that time. Um, so La Pietra now went from um, a very small number of AP courses to now being off, able to offer 15 or so different AP courses to their students um, through working with online school for girls. I think that it actually levels the playing field for schools now too. So I, as I mentioned at the beginning, the two independent schools that I went to were uh, Hotchkiss and Moreland Hill. Again, Moreland Hill, 60 students, grades 3 through 9, a teeny little neighborhood school. And Hotchkiss is you know, probably one of the larger endowments of independent schools. It's out there today. <laughs> There's no reason, though, that this little school couldn't offer some of the same opportunities that this big school did. <coughs> it used to be that if we wanted to compete as independent schools, we had to raise enormous amounts of money, build some extravagant facilities um, in order to kind of move up within um, stock up stuff in that school. That's no longer the case. Online learning can help to level the playing field significantly more with significantly less money. Uh, than ever possible. And we can lower costs by maintaining quality. Here's another example for you. Um, this is St. Andrew's Priory School in Honolulu as well. Um, you can see I have affinity for the Hawaii schools. Uh, St. Andrew's Priory in Honolulu, another small 200 person um, independent school in downtown Honolulu, uh, had called us up about a month and a half ago and said, you know, we have a situation here where we, we are not going to have an AP Calculus AB teacher next year. And we need to be able to offer AP Calculus AB for our students. We have six students here who are at that level and ready to take Calc next year. Is there anything you can do to help? So when they made that call to us, we reached out to the network and said, network of our schools and said, is there anybody else that's in the situation? Is there anybody else that needs Calculus here? Is there a way we can make this work? We needed a certain number of students in order to be able to run the class. And it turns out that there's a school in Memphis, St. Agnes and St. Dominic's, that was in the similar situation. So this school in Honolulu and this school in Memphis basically created enough students for us to be able to really offer the course and figure out how we were going to do it. So then we had to fix find the teacher. So when then we reached out to the network further and said, okay, who has some great teachers out there within the math departments who are ready for this type of challenge, who have done enough training within online education that we can catch them up to speed pretty quickly, and who are um, really excited by the opportunity to work with students from, from two schools at different ends of the country and, um, and potentially different and, and other students as well. Well, Marco School in Los Angeles had Chris Colon, who's the math department chair out there, who was recently featured on, on 60 Minutes, 
because of some of the interesting things that he's done with Khan Academy within Marlboro School. He has a classroom at Marlboro that has four or five different levels of students in the same classroom that are using Khan Academy in order to help kind of work through different levels of, 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 the, uh, of the curriculum at their own pace. With Chris kind of walking around and working within the room as teacher, facilitator, and coach for the students in the classroom. So Chris seems like you know he might be interested. It turns out he was really interested and really wanted to try to bring a class online. So in this case, we solved the problem of a school in Honolulu by connecting them with the school in Memphis and connecting them with the school in Los Angeles in order to create a win for St. Andrews Priory, a win for the school in Memphis, a win for the school in Los Angeles, um, and overall cost savings for the program. We were able to hire, we, they were able, because we can do our classes on a per student basis, we were able to um, satisfy this need at a much lower cost than either one of those two schools could hire a teacher. And again, we were able to do that with a top and outstanding teacher within the schools as well. This is, I think, some of the reasons why NIS has said very clearly in their online learning guide. If you haven't taken a peek at this before, this is a great starting point document. NIS is an online learning guide. Technology, from their Technology 21st Century Curriculum Task Force. In that guide, they said those schools that can leverage an environment of abundant online learning options will have a competitive advantage. I would argue that example from before is showing that those schools have a competitive advantage. The agile school will embrace new delivery models that add to its ability to offer diverse curriculum, will maintain the high standards of quality expected of independent schools. My takeaway from this would be, as well, from this kind of section of opportunities, that this consortium approach allowed our schools within the network to expand their course opportunities, to prepare students for 21st century education in a different way than they were able to just through face-to-face -face courses, and connect and work with like-minded schools and innovative schools from around the country. I'll stop there for a second um, before we get into the next little area. Yeah? Um, the like-minded is actually giving me pause. Um, yeah. So I read about a study or two that showed that um, as much as we think that online connectedness uh, exposes us to people with different viewpoints and, and different experiences, um, that it actually doesn't, the connections we make with people online are not that different than the connections we make in our, you know, in our immediate um, vicinity. Mm -hmm. um, and in your takeaway, you actually explicitly say like-minded. I'm talking about like-minded schools here. And okay. I think that, to me, again, if philosophy and mission are at the center of what we do as a school engaging with online learning, we should be working with schools that share that same philosophy and mission. So when I say like-minded here, I'm referring to the philosophy and mission yeah. that everybody can buy into. Specifically the blended or the online? It's specifically, online. in our case, connection, collaboration, creativity, and application. Okay. That this is the center of if this school. If these schools can believe that those should be the center of the online learning experiences for their kids, great. If they don't believe that, it's probably not the right fit for them. So do you find that there is a diversity not just in the geographic region where these students are coming from, but also in their political views, their dynamics? Yeah, within independent within the independent school community, there's not as much. Uh, okay. Diversity, I would say. I didn't think you'll know this. <laughs> this is nothing new, right? Um, so we're working with independent schools. So we're talking about diversity within the independent school. Okay. Course. However, I would say also that if you look at those the list of 67 schools, there are some very different schools from each other okay. with very different needs and schools that have never worked together and never honestly probably would have thought to work together before. I mean, this is a little school like St. Andrews Priory in Honolulu probably would never have worked with you know, but never first school before. Um, they wouldn't have seen the combination of work together. But in this case, they're very regular for students to stand for priority to get lots of the student combination. Yeah. I will not attack you again, but I <laughs> but how do how the schools that are co ed um in agreeing with with which ones you offer? Great question. The question was, how do schools that are co ed uh, integrate what we offer? They integrate in two ways, typically. Um, one, by uh, basically opportunity to the faculty to really use our professional medicine um, in order to 
and gave it back to you on the learning. Um, and two, they some some schools will have our courses, some co schools will have our courses as part of a couple of different options that a student might take, trying to tailor it to what the kid, uh, what's particularly right for the kid. Um, and three, there are a couple of schools that um, that may offer our courses to students um, when there's when there's a particular gender imbalance in a class. Um, sometimes AP computer science classes at schools can be ten boys and two girls, um, and that might not be the best experience for those two girls. Uh, multivariate calculus and those types of classes. But all of your students are girls. Not all of our PD classes, but but our PD courses are co-ed, but the but the courses are girls. So the PD courses you actually offer to teachers regardless of whether their students are enrolled in? Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. PD courses, any teacher from around the country can sign up for them. Yep. And probably, at this point, about half of the folks that take PD courses from us are not from our membership. <coughs> yeah. And obviously, a couple of the courses you mentioned um, are going to be particularly girl courses, but yes. the other ones, do you have some emphasis on what this is good for girls, which are a school for girls, or? Is it pretty applicable to everybody? They're pretty applicable. I mean, the, the how to teach an online class and the blended class, we're exploring those pedagogic, pedagogical approaches. We're not exploring gender within those pedagogical approaches. OK. So let's go into a little bit of how independent schools are approaching online learning. Um, and I'd like for you to think, as I'm, as I'm going through these, I'd like for you to think about where your school is within this continuum. Um, and I'm going to pull everybody here towards the end. There are probably about 35% of schools that are totally skeptical and are relying very much on the tried and true. These tend to be schools that are the established market leader within their community and or have extraordinarily large endowments. These are schools that think that they have too much to lose by change and are typically more resistant to change um, than some of their peers. Um, this definitely holds true within, within online learning. There are about 50% of independent schools that we're seeing out there now as what I call dabblers or lone wolves. Schools that are starting to dabble within online learning um, and are um, thinking about it um, or have a few students taking online classes or a few faculty who are starting to work on this, but they don't really have a plan of any type. They haven't started to kind of bring this to the next level and uh, other than maybe a few discussions about online and blended learning. Then we're now starting to see about 10% of schools with, that are truly piloting online learning programs and are having a plan for developing online learning programs as part of, um, as part of what they do at the school, as part of their kind of standard operating procedure within their school. These are schools that have had a number of dabblers or lone wolves typically for a couple of years um, and are are ready to kind of go to the next step with this. And then there are about 5% of schools that are strategic actors or thinkers. Schools that have already piloted plans, that have brought online learning into the larger conversation about what it means within the context of their school, have engaged all the different constituent groups within their school, will have discussions with parents about online learning regularly, will have discussions at the board level regularly, We'll do things like revisit the online learning guide from NIS and the questions that are posed in there with their administrative teams at least annually. There are schools out there that are starting to have, I would argue, a strategic advantage over other independent schools because they've engaged their entire community at a different level. I think that this is about 5% of independent schools, maybe a little bit less. Who would you say are some of the best? I, I, I'm on video not going to show that. <laughs> um, however, I, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of them happen to be within the network, within the network that we have, in part because we've been at it longer than anybody else. We do have a follow-up session yeah. that we scheduled. That would be a smaller group. <laughs> not a big. <laughs> Where would you say your schools are? How many of your schools, how many of you say that your schools are uh, purely skeptical of this and are just relying upon the tried and true methodologies? And so about 35%, probably a third of the others. Okay. How many of you would say that you are um, schools with dabblers or lone wolves? 
How many of you are the dabbler or alone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good luck to you. <laughs> How many of you are pilots with plan? Good. Typically what it takes to transition from being a dabbler or a lone wolf to a pilot with a plan is, uh, is support from the head of school. If you don't have support from the head of school on the board chair, you're not going to move from dabbler and lone wolf to pilot with a plan. And it, they have to take it on. It's not just support as in, oh yeah, this is good. This is support as in, okay, this is becoming a priority of the school. In order for this to move from one level to the next, you really need to have a focused approach from your administrative team. Um, and agreement that you are going to be focusing on this as a school. Any of you identify as strategic character Good. Okay. okay. Um, so, the, the, sorry, the last thing I wanted to ask there was, uh, why do strategic actors and thinkers do we think have an advantage um, on that? I'm going to throw it back at you right now. Yeah. Oh. Challenge that they do. Good. Um, I, I think it's not necessarily the best thing to be first to market on something like this because you can spend a lot of time solving problems that other people will just take and solve. So Tom's Tom's pretty important the argument that it's it, it there might be some benefit in not being first to market on this. You want to be tenth, but maybe second or third. Right. So you don't want to be tenth, but you don't. But you can you can certainly be second or third with this. What did anybody want to argue about? Yeah, yeah I think the, the first has already been done. Right. Uh, we are a school that is definitely, I would call us currently in 10% looking yep. to the five. And what we've done is recognize that we have a specific mission tie-in on this around global citizenship, around collaboration. So for us, this was a mission-driven decision that this is becoming the capstone for a thread of cultural interaction that for us began with video conferences with Japanese schools 25 years ago. Right. Um, using those ISDN ones. Right. Um, so we think that this, because we're doing it, consistent philosophy, consistent with mission, mission that this is just logical extension. And in terms of first to market, you know, I was doing this stuff with VHS.org 15 years ago. This right. is not news. Well, right. Well, I would argue that how much money has been wasted in like video conferencing? We've been to ISDN lines. There are many people who have you know video conferencing rooms and dump tens of thousands in there but never really use them. And if we're video conferencing has been around for 15 years, none of us really use it <coughs> significantly. So that's not online yet. I know, but you're saying that was the online ed of 1998. That's what I'm arguing. It might not be best to be first to market to put that video conference lab. You might want to focus on something else and wait till it. Now I'm saying it's starting to get there now. We're in the 10 percent. We're looking, but I don't know if we want to be that. I, I absolutely agree with you, Tom. And in terms of you know being first to market, I think that there's some danger in that. I would say though that the independent school market has greatly expanded over the last 10 years, and that we're not just competing with each other as independent schools. And that's the difference with this. So. With, with online learning, because now colleges are directly competing with independent schools for students, and because there are for-profit providers that are out there that are directly competing for independent school students, if we aren't competing with them within this online field, we're not, you know, we're not in danger of becoming second to market or third to market. We're in danger of becoming 20th to market within our own communities and within the own market that we used to dominate. That's, that's, I think, to me, the difference there. That it's not about becoming first to market within the traditional independent school community. That that ex community has expanded tremendously. And then if you are getting into this now, you're already tenant to market. Yeah? I have, a, I have sort of a different question. Your, your numbers here are about individual schools. Not individuals within schools. Right. But you're a consortium. Yes. Is there, I would guess, you would argue, there's value in, in being a consortium. Is there a market for a consortium of co-ed schools or all boys schools? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there is, there's, oh, repeat the question. Sure. The question is, um, is there, is there, do I argue, one, that there's um, uh, value in doing this as a consortium effort? And the second question is, is there a market available out there for co-ed and, and boys schools to kind of create their own consortium? Does that make more sense than 
a school trying to go at it on their own? Personally, I think so. Because with and there because there are very few schools that have within them the human resources in order to develop a fully online program themselves. And by human resources, I don't just mean the numbers of people, but the faculty who are uh, who are at the level of being able to move an entire curriculum online. Very few schools have done that type of professional development. I would also argue on that side note on that that we don't do ourselves we do ourselves a disservice by not pushing faculty these days. Um, because uh, this, this is starting to become much more and more part of the reality. Second question there about consortium effort, uh, whether there's room for market. Absolutely. I think that there is room within the online learning market for any, any school to develop, any consortium to develop around a mission and philosophy that's shared. So I wouldn't actually think of this as just co-ed consortium going out there. I think about this much more defined. I think about this like a progressive school consortium. I think about this as you know an Episcopal school consortium. I think about this as you know whatever mini consortium. It happens to be that the gender-based schools, the single gender schools, have been working together in a, in for some time now because of the uh, because of National Coalition of Girls Schools, et cetera, over the last number of years. Girls schools have been working together, and there's a defined philosophy and mission that we can coalesce around. I think that's probably true for boys schools, too. But I think actually within the co-ed market, it makes a lot of sense to even fragment further. So I don't think, I, I, that's why I, there is one um, consortium of independent schools that are co-ed that have worked together at Global Online Academy. Great. Michael Nakar, their director, is fantastic. Um, and, and they've done some very good work. I think there's room probably for additional um, co-ed fields, co-ed consortiums to, to enter the marketplace. Just based on that, again, keeping philosophy and mission at the center of what you're doing. Um, here are some things that, we've, this is, that, that we find important when online schools, again, are entering um, are entering the online learning landscape. And this is actually comes from a white paper. I just mentioned Michael from Global Online Academy. Michael Nakbar and I wrote a white paper together that tried to define the field of online independent schools. Um, and what Michael and I wrote about there was that as, as independent schools are entering the online learning landscape, they really need to stay, again, mission-driven and nonprofit. That they need to develop and hold dear the personal relationships between the that develop between students and students within their classrooms and between students and faculty, that they remain challenging and academically excellent as independent schools have, and that we really do know our learners and define, and this is I think important for this group, define our experience as secondary education as different from what's offered at the collegiate level. There are, again, lots of colleges that are out there that are marketing their college courses to students in the high school level. And it can become very appealing for a high school to say, well, it's okay because this course is offered by X, Y, and Z college or university. Personally, I think that that's a dangerous and slippery slope. I think that we need to define what our course and classroom experience is as different than what the colleges offer. Okay, a um, couple typical mistakes, and then we'll take some questions before we close up here. A um, couple typical mistakes that we see as, as schools enter into online learning um, is that it's all about the courses. Um, if they just think about online learning as, uh, as being about courses as courses with courses as commodities, then they're going to be entering this field uh, perhaps in not long-term uh, sustainable ways, in ways that they may regret in the future. It's all about the money. Again, schools, some schools are starting to think of online learning as just purely being about either additional revenue that they can bring into the school or as a cost savings measure. Um, we think that this is particularly dangerous for schools to think that online learning is just all about the money. And that it's not tied to mission. Um, hopefully I've hammered home by this point in the presentation that I think that mission and philosophy are extraordinarily important to an independent school uh, entering into online learning. Um, 
again, I think that that comes a lot from my background with working within independent schools and being in independent schools and knowing that strong independent schools are the ones that stick and stay to the mission <coughs> that they that they develop. And then finally, that they're not tied to culture. Uh, we all have different types of cultures within our independent schools, which means that we're going to have slightly different approaches to online learning. So you've heard me talk a little bit about you know, why I think a consortium is a particularly powerful approach for an independent school. I'll also tell you I think that it's not just a consortium, but that the consortium allows for flexibility within their schools. Um, we've taken uh, the view within the Online School for Girls Consortium that every school is at a different space within online learning. So we're not going to dictate to them how they're going to set their policies, how what they're going to do with their faculty, how many students they enroll in different classes. We're not going to set any of those guidelines because we know that for each school this is an individual journey that they're going through. I think that's been, been helpful for our schools um, in order to allow their culture to adjust to online learning. So we definitely have schools that are in that range from we have a couple of schools that are purely skeptical in our consortium, all the way up through the strategic actors and thinkers. We think that those schools, and we hope that those schools will work together to start to move up that chain. Uh, but that's going to take some time. And we think that's appropriate. Yeah? As an independent, as an independent online school, let's speak, and things you said about culture, it, uh, brought this question to mind. Do the people who are watching, the people who are teaching your online classes are teachers at member of the schools, right? Yeah. Um, do they end up with at least some sort of minimal relationship with like advisors or something like that of their students at the school? Is that part of school. what you explicitly, do your instructors actually, is part of what you say, an expectation or a practice that happens is there's a connection between the advisors and the students at the home school and your sure. Teacher. So the question is, which is kind of unique to independent schools. Yeah. The question is, how do you how do you deal with the advisor relationship that, that we set up within independent schools for online courses? Uh, we actually one of the few things that we do dictate to schools is we tell them that they have to have a school contact at their school, and that that person should think of themselves as an advisor for the students taking an online course. So instead of kind of directly connecting with the advisor at the school, we connect with one person at the school who has a knowledge of the online experience that's different than what we can get out there to everybody within that school, perhaps, um, and, and to have one point of contact for those kids. And so those kids then know, OK, if I'm having difficulty reaching my online teacher, if I'm having difficulty um, because I've gotten sick, because I got injured in a sports game, you know, I need an adult to help with this communication here. They know who to go to. The teacher also knows who to go to if that child needs a good kick in the pants to get going with their online classes. Because that, that advisor knows then, okay, I'm going to go find that kid in the dining room and whatever and, and make sure that they really get back on their own line. And you found that to be important? Absolutely. Oh, I would think oh, yeah. that's the difference oh, yeah. between the K-12 and the college. Oh, yeah. About it's, 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 so it's so important. It's so important to have that type of relationship. Yeah. yeah. And we, uh, despite the fact that I wanted that job when, when we joined the consortium, we deliberately put it on the Dean of Studies because we wanted it on someone who was clearly, purely academic. Uh, because we wanted everyone to be clear that the learning was owned over there. The fact that I also do instructional technology and a bunch of other stuff doesn't matter. That we wanted the kid to perceive this as this is part of the frame that when you're building your courses with the Dean of Studies, if you take an online course, the Dean of Studies is the person who's going to track you down. Well, yeah. And, and that, that, I think, is the right framework, and that's a framework that I suggest for most schools. Uh, the only caveat to that is if the person who is in that role does not understand or value online learning, mm -hmm. then that it's not going to work. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I noticed you've got some schools from pre-K all the way up. Yeah. Yet, while your courses are high school, how young? you see this being applied. I haven't seen a lot for the younger kids. You know, we've started to go into middle school mainly with our summertime courses, um, although uh, we have had middle school students take our year-long courses too. And as we get into lower level languages, we expect to have that happen more and more. Um, it, our program has tended to be high school driven because that's where the demand is right now, um, but that could change over time. Good question. I don't think that there's, I don't think with blended learning in particular, 
there's going to be a, a cap at how low you can go. With fully online learning, uh, I think there are still some questions for, for the youngest grades. Yeah? I'm going to do a online school or possibly. Um, how do you think employers do online schooling possibly? Is it an advantage or do you think the disadvantage uh, is the people who have had in class, just you know, physically in class? Good, good question. So the question is, how do employers view um, how do employers view online? Really, you're talking about online learning degrees, probably, right? Especially when two people are going up for the same job. One person had mostly online classes, right? And compared to someone who's been in the class, there's no question that most employers. This is changing and, and changing, I think, rapidly. But there's no question that most employers are looking at folks that have taken a fully online degree in a different way than folks that have taken a face-to-face -face degree. I think that's changing over time. Um, one of the things we were concentrated on with this was trying to make sure that colleges understood um, that for our students taking these online courses, it would be um, that it was as challenging, if not more so, than some of their face-to-face -face classes. And so we worked with college teams and admissions, et cetera, to help them understand um, what our program was, because we didn't want them viewing them as an easy out or an easy A. Sometimes online don't see about the time. Sometimes they don't, and sometimes they are not. Absolutely. And but I think I think also the experience of folks who have taken an online class is that they can often be more challenging than a face-to-face -face class and more demanding. So it's, it there's a, there's a cognitive disconnect, and, and you all showed this right at the beginning when I asked you to to tell me your word associated with online schools. You all showed what the cognitive distance distances, and it's often between folks who have taken online classes versus folks who have not taken online classes, which is again why I think that it's really, really important that our faculty and administrators have the experience of taking an online class sooner rather than later. I have a question. Yeah. Um, have you seen, if you could share your experience of a school, middle school, who would have uh, designated one class, for example, maybe foreign language, and they said that this class is going to be an online course. And so in a school where everyone is face to face, you have this one class that's online. Maybe 30, 40 kids are participating in this course and it shows up on their schedule. What is the feeling of the environment, the faculty, the staff, the parents, the administrators, to say that this one class everybody has to take? online? Totally depends on the school and the culture of the school. Most schools that try to do that are doing that because they want to pilot an online class for the first time. Right. My experience has been that when you talk with parents about, in, in your school community, about piloting a program, they understand, one, why it's important to pilot a program, and two, why you would want to pilot in this field. Uh, so my experience has been with schools mainly that have had positive experiences with piloting a class within their schools. But again, it can totally depend on the type of class that you're offering, what types, you know, who you're engaging with. Are you offering that class from your teachers? Is it somebody else's teachers that are offering the class? You know, who's the trusted source behind this? How many students are in the class? Is this class ever meeting face to face? There are a whole bunch of variables in play that, that really complicate things quite a bit. Is that course generally, I'm sorry, the second question. Is that like an additional payment that a, a, a parent would pay for a course like that? Or is that included in the tuition generally? It totally depends on the school. And Have you seen it in both ways? Yes. Um, it, within, within the consortium that we have, we don't dictate to schools whether they, they pay for the courses or whether uh, their families pay in addition for those courses. Uh, we suggest um, and we see over time that more and more schools are rolling the course course costs for like a student to take multivariable calculus with our program into the tuition of the school. And the reason for that is we're talking about being able to expand a course catalog for a school at a very low cost compared to what would be the teachers. Over time we've seen that change. Okay, we're gonna break now. Uh, I want to thank Brad. Thank you. For
um, and also give us a common vocabulary because we're going to need it.